Hey everybody, John Ray with Musing Wizard here. Of course, we've got Carl Brockman and we're going to be diving in today. Do we live in a simulation? You you hear people like Elon Musk and Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and, and the, these people that are rather high profile thinkers in, in the world talking about how reality isn't real. It's just an information field of zeros and ones and, and, and speculating on whether we live in base level reality. What does that even mean? We're going to unpack what it would mean if we live in a simulation, talk about why we may and, and some of the evidence that points to that, and then just play with some theoretics and, and a hypothesis of if this is a simulation, what does that mean that we can do and how can we interact with the world and reality and life in general differently than when we were thinking about it as a physical construct. So Carl, thanks for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you to guide this conversation. We're going to try to unpack how you can be the Neo in the Matrix um, if, if we are indeed living in a Matrix. But what are your thoughts on on simulation? Where, what direction do you want to take this in? And and what's kind of the, the pretext that you're coming into this conversation with? John, it is an absolute pleasure as always. Uh, the pretext I'm coming into this conversation with, I guess, is that I rendered this reality. I rendered this opportunity to speak to John a few times a week and continue to explore my own consciousness, my own spirituality, my own relationship with uh, things maybe perhaps a bit more intangible than the material world that we see around us. You know, I, I have uh, over the last few years developed a relationship with what I now call God after spending 20 six 27 years putting god in a box of religion it's it's just it's this uh this story that we we tell ourselves to feel better about the world and and that's been a very interesting uh experience with me but wh where i thought i could start and, and perhaps an interesting story for anyone who wants to listen to my voice i know this is the musing wizard podcast but uh a previous carl a younger carl he threw away a corporate quit career he sold a motorbike and he bought a bunch of podcast and, and visual equipment to start a podcast and uh during that uh time of his life he was listening to a lot of joe rogan a lot of lex friedman jordan peterson all of these guys and was very inspired by their ability to uh unpack uh, uh complex theory different perspectives experiences uh uncover the lessons that come out of it all and uh joe rogan spoke to a bloke called william von hippel who authored a book called the social leap and uh william von hippel uh, he in this book explores uh, our evolution from living in the Amazon to now being in more barren plains and the importance of social skills and ability to ward off predators uh, in groups you know uh, a lion will attack one man standing by themselves but if there are group of men and they're able to throw rocks and communicate with each other then the predator is able to stay away just to really simplify and boil down his book I loved that podcast. I bought his book and I open up The Social Leap. And in the introduction, William von Hippel is a lecturer at a university an hour away from my house. And I was thinking, okay, that's exciting. I'm sure I can find his email online. So I look up University of Queensland. Here he is, lecturer profile, William von Hippel of psychology and of sorts. Email right there. Awesome. William, my name's Carl. I'm a young man in Queensland. I've just launched this podcast where I'm interested in speaking to very interesting people about what makes them tick, what makes them stand out from the crowd and what lessons we can learn from these uh, seemingly successful or uh, unicorns in the world. Uh, would you be open to talking to me? Fast forward, I end up recording a podcast with William von Hippel asking, it shall be given. William then recommends that I speak to a young man called Sam. Sam Pearson was uh, one of his uh, research associates, was a previous student, did his thesis under Will. Uh, and then I got to speak to Sam Pearson about his time in, in Fiji and a few other different cultures. What he learned about human behavior, lessons, etc. 
And after my chat with Sam, I started asking him some uh, poignant questions about conspiracy, about a few different topics of interest that I had at the time. And he said, you know who you need to speak to? You need to speak to one of my friends, Regan Gallagher. He uh, just made an absolute mozza with Dogecoin. Uh, he just left academia for a few different reasons. He's building his own life coaching business to help people work and live outside of the matrix. I think you'd love speaking to him. And so I give Regan a call. Hey, mate, my name's Carl. Just spoke to your friend, Sam. I would love to get you on the podcast sometime. Would you be interested? Fast forward again. Regan comes to the studio. I'm speaking to this long haired, not academic from the outside looking in, but but truly uh, academic did his thesis on perception, was very interested in the mind and how we see reality. And now I work in a business with Regan. We help men overcoming overcome limiting beliefs, find purpose, uh, walk the hero's journey, uh, uh, turn their, alchemize their trauma into what makes them unique and special and can influence the world. And it just it, it, if we're if we're not in a simulation, like how how did I go from listening to Joe Rogan to then uh, talking to someone fourteen degrees away from William von Hippel and now building a business with him? I just think it's absolutely incredible. So when I hear simulation, when I think about simulation. There, there are a lot of things in my life that just I just seem to have decided to make happen. I just have seemed to decide that that is reality or I can make that reality. And uh, I was speaking to a friend this morning about it. Just it's funny. Every time I see something and, and feel like I, I feel and see it, I always end up there, which I think is quite remarkable. So that is kind of my pretext for simulation theory. I'm really looking forward to your insights, John. But yeah, tell me what your perception of that little story is and maybe uh, move into your own pretext. Yeah, well, just a another note of connection in, into that story is that you and I basically met through Regan's group. And, and, and so we're having this conversation as a part of that thread of things happening. So you you know the 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 way that i hear kind of intellectuals talking about simulation theory is this idea that we are slowly developing technology that allows us to basically simulate physics and and, and to simulate potentially consciousness you, you you know when when you look at things like open ai's new soma project or sora project the you it's a text to video platform where you can type in type in anything and it will create true to physics true true to life video content 60 seconds at a time that looks like you're in that situation but it's completely fabricated and and so one of the things that that I heard um Elon Musk and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about when when they're you know contemplating whether we live in a, in a simulation and if we do why why was the simulation created well well one of the reasons that we're inventing these ai structures right now is for more effective data mining right so so you know when it comes to running physics experiments or, or experiments on uh, at, you know at the molecular level you know whether it's virus studying viruses or, or studying molecules these can be really costly exper experiments to run in the real world and they they can have you know pretty dangerous side effects if done poorly we saw that with with the covid lab leak and and so one of the things that ai is getting to the point of is being able to simulate the physics of reality in such a way where you can actually run these data simulations uh and, and get real results as if you had actually run the experiment in physical reality so when somebody says well why would somebody create a reality like this you, you know one thesis is that there is a reality above us and and we'll get into kind of how reality stacks but but there there's a reality above us that created basically a simulation so that they could run data models to to determine what the most optimal actions were and we are simply cogs in that simulation that is that are living out different life patterns so that they can extract the data and not and and not have to go through the same mistakes at, at that base level of reality 
So when we talk about what is base level reality, base level reality is the first reality that exists because obviously there has to be some reality before you can invent a simulated re reality. And, and, and so base level reality is there's no reality above this one. It's the first one. And then in theory, there could be an infinite number of realities beyond that. And, and, and so when, when, when you get into all of these different models of reality and multiverse theory, the, the, this is this idea that, that there's an infinite number of, of potential realities. And, and these are basically just data sets of, of different things that are happening. It's me doing the exact same thing, same thing but I'm in a purple shirt. Um, and and the reason for for that is potentially to be able to extract data out of that. We're we're talking about like a technological simulation right now, and and then we'll get into the opposing idea, which would be like a consciousness simulation. But we know that we haven't invented a simulation that can simulate a reality yet. And, and so that means one of two things. It means we're either in base level reality or there's a million realities stacked above us or a billion realities stacked above us. And we're on the leading edge and we're the reality that's about to invent a simulation and then take the chain one step further. So it can only be one of those two things. We're not any of the in-between. So we're either the first one or we're the last one in the chain. And there's an old indigenous saying where, where somebody uh, asked them what the what the nature of the world is or the cosmology of the world is. And, and the, indi the indigenous used, used to say that the world is ju just a plate sitting on on uh on a turtle shell and and the, then uh the the young the young brave asks well what's underneath the turtle and the, and the the wise sage says it's turtles all the way down and so it's just this idea that the that that there's just these realities stacked one on the other on the other and and so when we talk about simulation theory we're we're contemplating are we in a constructed reality that that some other simulation created as a technological phenomenon to be able to extract data or are we in base level reality where where nobody has ever invented another reality other than this one but maybe we're about to with with ai and that would be a technological simulation or is it more akin to Tom Campbell's idea of a consciousness simulation where we re, reality basically runs these uh, these reality potentials? So, so they're basically part of an information wave and, and, and they're potentials of an infinite amount of thing happening. But our consciousness becomes the light that moves through one of those realities and kind of collapses it into something that we can actually physically experience. And, and the type of reality that I practice and hypothesize around is that is more that consciousness simulation where, where we, we live inside of a probability wave and, and we're using our consciousness to kind of collapse reality and render it around the feelings and ideas that we have as a way to do the same thing that a technological simulation is doing, we're extracting data as part of a learning process, as 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 part of a consciousness evolution, you, you know, program basically, and and so we invent these simulated experiences made up of consciousness in order to evolve as a soul or as a consciousness or as an entity. And, and and so when we play with reality in that way, that that there's there's a consciousness relational element to reality to us, to our thinking and feeling, rather than it being random, that's where the magic comes in. Like, like that's what magic is. It's learning how to work with that simulation and render things in in, in a way that is in alignment with it, with your vision or your feeling rather than having reality project randomly onto you. So I'll pause there because that was a lot to go through, but the, the core of it is turtles all the way down and, and you get to choose which of those turtles you're perceiving in. Turtles all the way down. We're either, we're either at the top or at the bottom. 
that that was a very a very interesting uh analogy to sort of play out in my head and you spoke about you spoke about a potential and and i guess just infinite potentials that we're able to discern through and and uh allow uh, us to render i think of about that just from an intellectual perspective with thoughts you know we we have thoughts we have ideas and we can allow them to play out as potential just without in it inside our own consciousness without actually uh taking any steps or making any change in reality and we can almost play that game in what i would call the micro in comparison to this conversation but the micro and explore that potentials without <clears throat> without having to learn those lessons or, or play that game ourselves, And then I come back to, yeah, simulation, turtles all the way down. Are we the plate on top of the turtle? Or are we the bottom turtle that's starting to stack turtles up on top of ourselves? That's just a wild thing to try and, to try and get my head around and unpack. Uh, what, well, what is your perspective there? Do you have a perspective? Are we the base reality? Are we the first one with none above us? Or... Are we truly just in a a reality where potentials and data is extracted and explored? Yeah, I I don't know, but but if I had to t- take a hard stance on it, we, you know, I think that it's probably like a combination of, of all of that. Be because I tend to lean towards this idea that we live in kind of like a quantum potential, and and, and, and so the light of our consciousness could could literally experience anything that that we can align to and and that we can believe is possible for what we're perceiving as humanity be because what we believe about others is what we have to take into reality with us and and, and so you know i can't by myself make the sky green right now unless i believe that everybody else could also believe that. And, 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 and so the interesting thing of the magician, like, like to be able to do that is that you have to recognize that you're in an emotional node sync with every other person that you perceive as being alive on the planet. And, and, and so you have to make choices based on what you think they think and, and and so if you can't get to a place where you think that they're going to be able to think that, then you're not going to be able to affect reality in that way because you're letting their ideas play into how your reality is rendered. And, and so then you get into this really kind of murky ground of like solipsism, which is this idea that you're the only entity and that there are no other entities, that they're all projections of you and that you actually are the God and and that it doesn't matter what you do. And, and so the, this can be kind of a maniacal place to, to live in. And and I I think it it's more likely that everybody is having kind of the, the this Venn diagram effect with, with one another. And, and, and so we have a personal universe, the, this kind of personal bubble quantum reality that we live in. And then we call forth aspects of, of, of people that match that. And, and so I used to talk about it as the alphabet of consciousness where, you know, I may get Carl at the letter B every time I engage with him B, B, because in my mind, I'm rendering Carl at level B. But when he's with somebody else, he may be he may be letter Z and and. and I'm engaging with the same kind of consciousness form, but but I'm just calling out different parts of that. And, and, and so, you know, Carl may want the experience of being at a letter B sometimes and a letter Z sometimes. And, and like, we're all always mixing like this. And, and, and so it, it's almost like our consciousness shifts based on the dance that we want to do with, with other people. And, and reality is kind of made up of all of these personal universes that, that are constantly kind of synchronizing. And, and, and there's a physics at play there where, where if your personal universe isn't a match to something that I'm creating in mind, like if you're not open to, to that idea, then maybe there's some overlap, but it's going to result in, in a clash where, where we're not really synced on, on anything 
Or, you know, if I'm already living in a, in a universe that's so far removed from your reality, you're just not going to see me, you, you know, and, and you hear stories all the time about these like guru avatars that that are like walking around in their astral bodies. And, and if, if that's a part of your reality makeup, you can see them, but most people can't. You know, the the same goes with with like why do some people see UFOs and and other people don't? Like it, it, it's all about the makeup of your consciousness and what you're willing to receive as, as information in your data stream, and you're going to skew towards collapsing potentials that that represent that. So I'm not sure if I'm saying it the the best way where it makes sense. Maybe you can ask some questions, but but basically, my sense is that. If you could believe that everybody else could believe that we're in base level reality, then you could probably have that experience play out over the course of your lifetime. But if you can't believe that, then, then you have to work within your belief system. And, and, and so then now you're living on a probability wave where, where you're like, well, I guess it's probably like a 60, 40 chance. And, and, and so then you you know may maybe you experience that you're in base level reality but maybe you experience something else because you're more open open to ideas and and i think this is where like manifestation as a concept kind of gets misconstrued be, be because it's not necessarily what you believe is possible for you it's what do you believe other people believe is possible for you? Because that's the thing that limits you. So if you're taking all of these telepathic projections from the world that are saying, well, that's not possible. Nobody can do that. If you take that on as actual data, then that's going to be true because it becomes a part of the way that you're rendering reality. So, so you have to really learn how to cut the hooks of all those pendulums and telepathic projections that are coming at you and, and, and understand how to be truly visionary, which is to be able to see the world without the projections of other tainting how you see it. Yeah, the way I understand that to try and boil down uh, your exploration is that so as as we uh, as these comments or these beliefs from others come into our universe, our relationship with them will ultimately determine our universe, how we vibrate to use a, a, a somatic term that we've used in the past. And based on that relationship of self or, or the influence of our universe will then dis discern or determine what other universes we either collide with or integrate with or are able to connect with able to see so that that makes a lot of uh, sense to me in the sense that yes how i've I, I guess structured my reality how i'm structuring my universe how i see it how i feel it how i live in it ultimately determines what other universes as you've suggested the inf the seven billion universes that exist today how they either come in and connect and synergize how they clash and push away how they create friction or how I never see them because perhaps I'm on completely different wavelengths. Uh, and, and it links to a lot of things that we've spoken about and that I've, I've come to learn is, is that our relationship with self, our, our relationship with this existence as beloved, so, uh, so below as above, so below as within, as without, you know, it, it the life is a mirror and it makes sense to me that it, regarding a simulation, whether it is the uh, probability wave, whether it is the one at the bottom or it's the base root level reality at the top, it still is our relationship, how we are continually evolving and structuring our universe that determines how we integrate with the macro and the, the 7 billion other universes that are in play. And the interesting thing about Tom Campbell's work, um, he, he was a physicist and, and, you know, he was written a book called, called my big toe and, and it's his big theory of everything. And, and, what he talks about is that this consciousness simulation, you know, which is kind of this probability wave that, that I'm talking about, is is constructed in such a way where it's trying to reduce entropy. So, so when you're not aligned with love, when you're more aligned with like destructive forces, then things start to break down, be it because no one's hold, nothing is holding hands, ideas aren't connected. And so because of that, 
you you have this natural erosion or entropy that that happens and and reality starts to break down into chaos but what happens when you align yourself with love or this more holistic thinking the, this idea that kind of all all is one or or that we're all in it together you you actually using conscious thought are are able to slow entropy and and, and solidify the world in in a more meaningful way and and so what he talks about the the reason that the consciousness simulation is designed the way that it is is it's an entropy entropy reduction simulation. It, it is de designed to create a a holistic state of of optimal energy efficiency, and, and and so that's why aligning yourself with love is the most optimal strategy. Be because the simulation the the consciousness machine is going to. Um, elevate and honor nodes in the network that that are reducing entropy most effectively, and and so the goal is entropy reduction, and 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 so you can basically ask yourself: Is what I'm doing destructive in in some way to myself, to others, or reality, or 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 is it constructive? And things that are constructive are rewarded by the consciousness simulation. Which which makes sense as you as you look at how we evolve, right? We're continually order, uh, ordering and reordering the chaos that nature and the universe presents itself, and uh, we are later sometimes finding out the consequences of what we thought the right ordering should be or could be. And you see, I, I'm thinking about almost like economically at the moment, you know, you see the economy thrive and boom until it goes bust because perhaps the the foundation or or the 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 root on which it was built wasn't quite right, wasn't quite aligned, wasn't quite in tune with the well the the goal of the probability wave, which is to reduce entropy at the macro so i find that really really interesting uh, because that that i guess is what we are inclined to do or at least us that are looking to uh, develop self looking to build better relationships with self looking to achieve whatever level of success we see in our future we essentially are just trying to reduce entropy trying to order our reality in a way where we can move towards a a destination arbitrary or not or at least find ourselves on the the hero's journey, the the progressive path, and it, 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 like going from a career to starting our own business. That is the the complete opposite of reducing entropy. But that isn't then in fact your goal as you move towards and continue to evolve. Is that you you are slowly building not only competency but system structures. You are ordering the chaos, which will always present itself uh, with new chaos, new dragons right. to slay. Well well, and the interesting thing in chaos theory, so so there's a model in, in chaos theory where you're looking at an hourglass and sand is dripping down from the hourglass and it's forming this mound and the mound is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And and, and so in, in in your mind, your your mind is like, ah, the mound is good at getting good. This is this is really successful. Well, what happens is the mound gets so big that it collapses in on itself. And and so at first glance, you could interpret that as a failure that 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 you you know the structure failed itself and and that it it didn't it should have it should have built the mound in a different way but it's not a failure because when it collapses into itself it forms an even tighter foundation and then the mound can grow even higher and so when you're watching the sand drip down the sand will get to the point of a mound the mound collapses into itself now it has a tighter foundation and then the next mound will be even bigger and that is the process of of transmuting energy in such a way to reduce entropy so that things are tighter, stronger, more foundational. And, 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 you know, what is entropy in the body? It's aging. So the more that you align yourself with love and, and, and aligning yourself with love means that you have to be aligned with truth. So the more that you're telling the truth to yourself and to others, the, the, the more that you're processing out your shame and your big feelings. This is why feeling your feelings is so much because it's part of getting back into the frequency of love. Well, 
in theory, and you and we we hear many avatars and, and gurus talking about this, if you were wholly aligned with love, you would reduce the aging process to the point where you could potentially start to age backwards and that there's this optimal age of, of around 33 where, where you're in this kind of perfect physical condition and, and that that is a condition that you can train your body to be in you know, holy you, for extended periods of time. And and so then you look at the Old Testament and these people in the Bible that are living to be thousands of years old, the, you, you know, that, that, are, that, that are alive until they're 900. Like, why does the Bible call that out? And who are these people that are living this long? The, these are people that weren't abstracted through sin and what is sin it's it's just making a mistake it, it's missing the mark so so the more abstracted these people got from god's love by 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 missing the mark and and not honoring their their co-creative power with god the more that they started to suffer entropy and entropy is aging and and so that's why over time in the bible People don't live to be 900 anymore. They they're living to be like 60 or 70, and and that's still kind of the the place that that we're at. But you see all the time. There, there's a great documentary um, about opti uh, is it opticentarians or uh, basically people who live to be over 110 years old. And 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 so this guy's interviewing you know all these 110, 111 year old people trying to figure out like what's the secret and and he's a big vegan and he thinks it's going to be all about diet. And, and, you know, the, fr the first lady he goes to, um, he, he says, well, you know, what's the secret to being 111 years old, Madge? And she's like, well, at 3 PM every day, I go and meet with my daughters and I have a cigarette and a shot of tequila. <laughs> and, and, you can see just like the blood drain out of his face because that's not what he wanted his documentary to be about. But come to find out, the more important thing was people who were aligned with family, with community that 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 were still like heavily involved in their church or being of service, who who at 110 years old were still serving soup at the soup kitchen. Like these are people that were highly aligned with love because they had love in their life. And because of that, that allowed them to be an anomaly in the aging process. And, and my hypothesis, you know, based on all of the things that I've studied and people that I've listened to and, and intuitions that I've had is that the more honest, radically honest we can be with ourselves and the more wholly aligned with, with like the doing the things that we want to do and trusting that reality will, will support us, the more that we reduce that entropy in, in our body and in the world around us. And, and we organize chaos in such a way that we can live to be 120, 130, 140, maybe older. And, and reality will support us in a meaningful way by effectively aligning with love. And I think there's a misconception about what that looks like because a lot of people are like, oh, does that mean I have to give everything up and, and go be Mother Teresa and, and taking care of people? It, 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 what it means is if that is the thing that lights you up more than anything in this world, then yes, you should give up everything to go and do that. But if the thing that lights you up more than anything else is something else, then, then everyone's intuition is showcasing to them where their most optimal performance they can have is. And it comes by following the breadcrumb path of what is most interesting to you in each moment. But too often we discard our interests because we we have these predetermined goals that, that society tells us we're supposed to get to. And so we don't really ever explore our curiosity to the wholest extent that we could. And because of that, we end up engaging in entropy rather than entropy reduction. And we start to age and, and stress plays itself out on us. And the way that we overcome the stress is just by getting back to being naturally curious about the things around us and then wholly exploring whatever seems most interesting in the moment. Yeah, that that integration of child curiosity is truly a superpower. Uh, you alluded to earlier, you know, the, the potential uh, frame in which we can see the world is that we are the only being. We are the only... Uh, avatar that has sentience or consciousness and i remember as a child feeling that way 
You know, I remember at times in my life as a child, like it, for whatever reason, the frame of mind, it never stuck there. It never, I never operated, I, I believe, in a long time in that frame. But I remember times when like, oh, am I the only real thing? Am I the, the only person that's going through these these challenges or these frames of thought or these uh, these crises? You know, everyone else seems to just be floating along through life knowing exactly what to do. Am I the only one? that uh that is questioning all of this and and it it does get stamped out but i don't think it's the un, unless it is at the uh the effect the negative effect of other people i don't think it's necessarily the the worst game to play you know and this links back to the simulation right like if it is truly a simulation then i am truly the only uh person in this rendered reality uh what does that mean what does it mean to follow my nose of curiosity? What does it mean to follow my gut and try that thing that just absolutely makes no sense aligning to the expectations that my dad has given me or that society has given me or that my teachers at school have given me? What does it mean if I just go out and quit a very secure, well-paying job to earn no money for a year and a half and just try and speak to great people? What does that ultimately mean? Uh, it, yeah, not, not, not necessarily the worst uh, way to play the game. Right. And the, the the place where people get uncomfortable with, with solipsism, the, this idea that I'm the only one, is when you don't acknowledge the entropy idea that, that we've just talked about. So if you believe that you're the only person in the world and then you become a destructive force in that world you're causing entropy in the world. And, and and so whether the Carl that I'm talking to right now is another entity or whether the Carl that I'm talking to right now is is just a telepathic projection that I created in, in my reality, it doesn't matter because both Carls are programmed to be um, optimally aligned with, with entropy reduction and, and, and uh, discordant when it, when it comes to um, inter, entropy and, and destruction. And, and, and so if I believe that I'm the only one and therefore I can, you, you know, ju just get rid of everybody or do whatever I want and, and be like a 100% narcissist, I'm not reducing the entropy. And, and so the consciousness simulation, which is an energy construct that, that is trying to reach higher states of frequency basically like a computer that's trying to run better and and, and 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 so if i'm a destructive force inside the machine the consciousness of simulation is going to be like who the heck is this guy causing so much freaking entropy in the system this is lagging all of our processors we've got to take this guy out and 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 so then reality conspires against those type of people and that's why they end up dying these tragic deaths and and, and maybe they have a short epic run but but ultimately con the consciousness machine is looking for entropy reduction and, and and so it will take out anyone that that is overclocking entropy in in the state and, and and so solipsism aligned with the idea that the goal is to be wholly aligned with love and and to reduce entropy as much as possible, which means treating everyone with kindness and, and, and from this heart connected place, that's a more interesting experiment that, that, you know, doesn't have, um, the perceived negative effects of, you know, just being a, a solipsis that, that is, that is absolutely, um, void of the concept of, of, of their impact on entropy in the system yeah well said I, the the results of that game can be quite quick to show themselves as well you know both ways uh to to absolutely discard the people the environment the things around you just to play your own games if you're the own being will of course create your own entropy, will of course create your own chaos. And the disconnection of awareness might mean that, oh, life's unfair. This is bullshit. Uh, yada, 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 negative emotion. I can't take any responsibility. It's just the way it is and can continue to perpetuate down that cycle. Or just just finding ways to be of service. You know, you shared uh, when you were running your landscaping business, just finding that house with the, the bad lawn and just how much beauty how much value, not monetary, not career-wise, not leading to anything, but just how much value there was in just helping that person out in being of service. Had that then created, again, an influence on your own universe and how it's structured and how it's projected and obviously compounded to us speaking 
here today, which is obviously a massive blessing for you, John. How could you wish for anything else than to be here with me right now? Right. I'm, uh, I'm in the <laughs> ultimate entropy reduction engine right now. <laughs> spot on, spot on. Uh, so how, how does uh, Tom Campbell's perspective, uh, the pro- uh, probability wave, the consciousness simulation relate to your relationship with, with spirituality, with faith, with God? Yeah, well spirituality i can't remember the exact terms that that tom campbell uh uses but but basically they're computing terms and and so you know i a lot of times in spirituality like uh the this optimal wisdom you know that that's available to you is sometimes represented as like an angel sometimes it's represented as like a wise alien or entity sometimes it's represented as as like your spiritual team or a spirit being sometimes it's represented as your higher self and and in tom campbell's world those things are all accurate but but they're basically representations of the the uh, larger consciousness system and and so the larger consciousness system's job is to raise the entire system in frequency be, because the higher frequency the system the better it's going to process and render information and and it is an efficiency machine it's programmed to be finding the most optimal route in all, in all things and and so as you're engaging with it you can tap into basically like the sys the system administrator of of the consciousness system, this kind of higher self, and it will give you insight into how you can most optimally reduce entropy in the system. So if I'm playing a small game and I only have access to, you know, my family and and it's four, four members, well, that's the part of the system that I can reduce entropy in. But if I'm a world leader, you know, or or even maybe a celebrity that has like a strong voice, um, or or I'm a a, a global entrepreneur that that a lot of people listen to, well, now I have a much greater chance of reducing entropy in the system, be because I can model what entropy reduction looks like, and and, and so as you're receiving from the consciousness sysadmin, um you know, this higher self, you're basically going to be given or even called into action be, be, because the, the system might say, you know what, we're having this entropy problem here and, and it's just growing. And, and the entropy, entropy problem is, is that society has picked up this thought form that that's a it's a mind virus and the mind virus is destructive to the system and it's making it run much less efficiently and this person has the exact voice and frequency and and life experience to be able to empathize with these people and get them to see that that the mind virus isn't real and and, and be able to give them the prescription so the sys admin of the consciousness simulation might call you up to basically be the entropy reduction solution that they send into this. And so that might mean that you have this strange loop of synchronicities that puts you into a place of leadership that that now these people that are suffering from the mind virus are listening to you. And, and now you, because you're continually tapped into that intuitive flow with the system administrator, are, are able to perfectly channel the words and and emit the frequency that the mind virus needs to hear in in order to heal that and, and and remove it from the system so that the system can continue to elevate into higher frequency you know and and and, and so when you think about great world leaders throughout time like the these were agents of entropy reduction the 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 sys admin called in into into being and, and called up in order to serve the entire system and make it more efficient and and so this idea is somewhat akin to what we've talked about in the past like pendulums right it, it's basically these energy constructs that are balancing themselves and 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 so in crypto we would call it game balance like in any system you're trying to find economic balance in the system so all of these ideas you know are kind of representing the same thing which is that ultimately there's information and that information can be processed inefficiently or efficiently 
And entropy is when information is not being processed efficiently. And, and entropy reduction is when information is being processed as effectively as it could be processed. And our ability to engage with reality to basically manipulate the the information field, which is what spirituality is, is it's being able to read into that field, that that ability becomes stronger the more that we become aligned with love and truth. Yes, the, the quest box pops up and uh, the call is, Carl, do you accept this quest? Yes or no? And in reality, the simulation needs someone to walk the quest. So uh, like I, I uh, think about the story of Facebook, right? And there were other people's with social networks. You spoke about your own social network uh, around that time. And this, the, the simulation needed to render the, the Facebook of today and gave many people the quest, the call, the opportunity to press yes and walk the path. And un until the right person in the right frame of mind with the right uh, function said yes and walked the path completely. And uh, I, I like you hear it all the time. You might have a really good idea that you're like, oh, that that would be great. Maybe one day. And then uh, six months later, someone's already invented it and they're on their way. You know, like the call, the sys admin is, is presenting you with these things all the time, but it, it needs to manifest. If you're not going to make it manifest, the energy will be uh, created and utilized somewhere else. That's exactly right. And and so how do you man when 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 the sysadmin calls you and 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 puts something on your heart, which is basically just like a knowing, right? That's what that in Christianity, when somebody says, Oh, it was put on my heart, it's just like I had a knowing about something. Like they there was zero doubt in me in the thought. And and so when when that happens, then the next step is what is now the most interesting thing that I could do? Like if, if I wasn't afraid, what what could I do? How would I show up? How could I align myself more wholly with, with love and truth? And, and, and so this is why the old biblical stories are so interesting be, because let's think about Joseph. So Joseph was um, the son of Israel, I, I, I think, and, and he had the these seven brothers and and I may be getting the numbers right, but but it's not important to the story. So the father, Israel, favored Joseph. He, he was the favorite son and all the other sons knew it and they were jealous of Joseph and, and, and they knew that he was going to get a bigger inheritance than, than them. And so one day they, they're out traveling and they're tending to, to their flocks and they say, hey, let's murder Joseph. And, and, and so they're about to murder him. And then one of the brothers says, ooh, do we really want murder on our hands? Like may, maybe let's just throw him in a well and sell him as a slave. So they throw him down into this well. And then these Canaanites come and they sell him into slavery to get rid of him. And then they they slaughter a, a calf and they put the blood on Joseph's uh uh, robe and then they bring it back to the father and they say hey joseph has died and then the father is like oh i'm gonna grieve forever so now joseph he's been in a well now he's sold into slavery they take him back to egypt he's in prison in egypt and he just tries to be of service wherever he can be of service so all these people are having like these different nightmares and dreams in jail and he's a prophet like he knows that he's connected with the sys admin and, and and so he goes and he offers offers a comforting bedside manner and he helps interpret their dreams and and helps interpret like what the sys admin is trying to tell each of these people and then these people are like so thrilled and and so Joseph in prison gets the the reputation of being someone who's a dream interpreter who who God speaks through who the sys admin gives an interpretation script to. So then the king of Egypt or the Pharaoh have, has the, this crazy dream and he's he's talking to all of his mages and, and his wizards and, and trying to figure out what it is and none of them can interpret it. And one of the prison guards is like, hey, king, there's actually this guy in jail who's pretty good at dream interpretation. Do you want him to take a stab at it? So Joseph goes and interprets the king's dream and he basically says, Oh man, it's so good that that you called me. You know the message that I'm getting from the sysadmin God is that there's going to be these seven years of just like 
flourishing in in in, in Egypt and and it's going to be so profitable for the kingdom but then that's going to be followed by 7 years of famine where where everything dies and so what you need to do is make sure that you're taking I forget what the number was, but like one tenth of whatever's produced during this time and storing it up so that you as the Pharaoh will then be able to distribute food for the seven years that there isn't any. So then the king is like, this is amazing. He takes Joseph out of jail. He makes Joseph his second in command in all of Egypt. And Joseph puts this plan together where where they store all of this up. And then when the famine comes, the Pharaoh is seen as this hero be, because he enacted Joseph's plan because Joseph was called up by the sysadmin. And then Joseph's brothers have to come to Egypt because they don't have any food and they're like begging for food. And, and, and Joseph, jo- Joseph puts the, the cup in, 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 puts a cup in and, and accuses them of stealing in order to get his dad to come to Egypt. And then he's like, surprise y'all I'm your brother. And he, then he totally like forgives them. And, like he's so aligned with entropy reduction that he became second in command in all of Egypt. And it's just like a hilarious story of something that is seemingly a series of like incredibly unfortunate events. I'm in a well, my brothers tried to kill me. I'm in jail now. And, and, and then within a few years, you're the second in command in all of Egypt. And, 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 except for the pharaoh the most powerful person on the entire planet so how do you take the calling from sis admin you move forward and you do the best with whatever is presented to you and you will continually be called up and up and up into greater levels of service but the second that you're like, fuck this reality is against me god doesn't like me i never get it my way well you you are not a player in the game. Like you're, 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 there's no way you can be on the leaderboard with that attitude. That was the, my favorite part of the, that uh, particular story in the Bible was surprise y'all. It's me, (laughs) Joseph. That was my favorite bit. Well, I know. Uh, (laughs) What's so hilarious in that story is that they don't recognize them. (laughs) Oh, that, uh, what a, what a beautiful story. And it reminds me of the, the parable of the farmer and the horse, if you'll allow me, you know, there was Mm -hmm. a farmer in a small village with a single horse horse who helped him earn a living for his family and uh how lucky he was uh, to have that that great horse said the the village and he would reply well maybe and then one day the horse ran away and the village comes to express their their condolences to the farmer and uh would say things like how unfortunate that that's terrible and and the farmer would reply well maybe And then a few days later, the horse returned and uh, came with it 10 other horses and the village again. What a good fortune. What incredible luck. And the farmer replied, well, maybe. The following week, the farmer's son was on one of the wild horses and fell off and broke his leg. And the villagers in dismay come back to the farmer and uh, say, what dismal luck. How unfortunate. And the farmer in character says, well, maybe. The next month, a military officer comes to the village and recruits all able-bodied men for the war. The sons, uh, the farmer's son with a broken left was left behind and the villagers were joyful. Your son has been spared. What beautiful luck. And the farmer replied simply, well, maybe. Yeah. And that really is how it is. Like you just have to kind of take it as it comes and and be willing to be in alignment with whatever is there and, and and trust that it's less about what's happening and more about how you're responding to it and and, and so to be hyper emotional or overclocked in an emotion in either direction is non optimal it doesn't serve the entire system what serves the system is you being a clear channel for energy, energy to flow through which means that you're not hyper polarized in either direction you're you're in this perfectly balanced state and to do that you have to feel your feelings be be because the the especially if you don't have like a regular sitting practice you're going to have a lot of gunk in the pipes and and so when energy when, when reality tries to flow energy through you as a node in the network it's not going to be able to do that very easily. And, and, and so are you going to be the the chosen node of reality if, if you're 
if your pipes are all gunked up, if you're not an efficient user of, of energy, if, if you're not somebody who can eff effectively process reality, no, it's going to go with somebody that is more optimally suited to having huge flows of energy moved through them. And that's what leadership is. It's the ability to integrate all of that quickly. Yes, it is. And and just again, that that awareness of of how you are structuring your world, your your frame, yourself, your kingdom, you know, it's it is a hundred percent up to us to discern, to perceive what we well, you said knowing before, what we ultimately know to be true, you know, that voice, that God, that judge, that that uh, intuition, God is is within us all. And uh, should we choose to listen? Uh, that is that is up to the individual to decide, and that will ultimately determine what other universes you come come across in your your little journey. So, if we're going to play the hypothesis, uh, play this hypothesis, John, and we are going to act as if this was. A simulation and we are the last hurdle not yet ready to create our own simulations in which we can experiment and extract data what is what is the optimal game to play how do we make the most of this simulation yeah well i think the key is recognizing that you can spin up your own simulations whenever you want so something that i've been doing the 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 past few weeks that is an interesting experiment to to run is you know, I I have been going through some of uh, Alistair Crowley's Thelema text, and, and and so people have mixed feelings about him. But but he he has some really interesting takes on on just the astral body and and the nature of reality. And and one of the things that I started to do to just kind of play around with this idea that you have this light body, it's a consciousness body, right? So you have the consciousness body, and then you have the physical meat sack. And so when I've been going on my runs each day, I go on my run from my house down into the trails, all through the trails, and then back up to my house. So I just physically ran the four miles. But then after I take a shower, um, I sit in, 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 a, in my chair, and then I rerun the route just in my mind. So what I'm doing is I'm spinning up a simulation I literally picture myself leaving my body, walking out my out my door, and then I run a simulation of me running the entire route in making up, filling in all the details of, of, of the run, but doing it faster than I did when it when I did it physically. And, and, and then I go all the way through that and then I come back in. And it's a really interesting experience because you can get so lost in it, or at least this is what happens to me, so lost in it that you can for moments at a time trick yourself into into thinking that you're actually on the run again and and and, and so then this got me thinking oh my god this is a simulation. I just launched a simulation of what would it look like if I ran this route faster? And, and, and I'm literally training the neural networks in, in my mind through this astral simulation to be able to do it in the physical world faster the next time. And, and, and so then I was like, oh my God, everything is a simulation that, that you can enact. And, and, and what is a simulation? It's just something that you spin up in order to extract data that you can pull back into this reality. So what does it look like if the, if I spin up a simulation and then I literally walk through my day as if I'm going to my dream job and, and, and I'm walking through that world and I'm building out that simulation of what it's like? I'm training my neural networks to be able to see information that's going to allow me to do that here. So visual, it, it, it took my visualization to a new level because before my visualization was almost like 2D, even though I try to get it to a holographic place where where where, where it, it's a world, but by, by, by recognizing it as a simulation, I had to build the whole world. If it, it, it's not just, oh yeah, I'm I have a good job, I see a paycheck. No, the the to to simulate it in the astral is to walk around in it. 
So I, I, I get up out of, I, I envision myself getting out of bed and in my astral body, I'm, I'm taking a shower. What, what, what does that feel like? Have a, am I looking forward to my day? Like, like how, how am I eating breakfast in, in, in my kitchen? What, are, how, what is my girlfriend and I's interaction? Okay, now I'm in my car. Where am I even going? Like, what car am I driving? And, and, and now I'm going through, through, through my neighborhood. Are people waving at me? Like, like, is the sun shining? I, 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 like, am I so impressed with all the homes and the neighborhood that I live in? Okay, now I'm I'm in this office. What is the office? Oh, do I have a penthouse view? Now I'm in this penthouse view. What was the elevator ride up? Like I'm literally walking through this reality. And so what am I doing? I'm feeding energy into the feedback loop of this reality that says, hey, this experience over here, I want you to take this data set and download it into this experience over here. And so... I think that that's a more optimal way of manifesting. I mean, I've only been doing it for for a, a couple of weeks, but but it's definitely a more interesting way of doing it. And so I'm just floating out there that that might be the most optimal way to engage with the simulation is to 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 realize that you can literally through your consciousness throw your consciousness the way that a ventriloquist throws their voice and spin up whatever reality you want, live it out. You, you, your brain starts to figure out what the physics of, uh, uh, at, at a metaphysical level are of living that type of life. And then it's like in the matrix when, when, when Trinity downloads the helicopter, how, the, the plans on how to fly the helicopter, let, let, like you, you're building it over here. It gets spun up in a way where it starts to attract other information that builds out all the detail. And then when you come back into your body, you're integrating all of that information. And I think that that's an interesting experiment that you can run to see, do you have any tangible effect on the world around you? And if that experiment comes out true and you do, does that mean that you're in a simulation? I can't wait to try that. <laughs> very, very interesting. It, well, it reminds me of, uh, well, I, I've played football most of my life. I don't anymore, but I would visualize taking that specky, kicking that goal, tackling that big bloke that was twice the size of me. And, and time and time again, not that I was a superstar, but I would, I would do those things. And it wasn't, it wasn't right. It wasn't 2D. It wasn't a fixed thing. It was like, it was the the whole, it was the journey of it. And it makes sense when we, you speak, you hear all of the people, whether they, they know it truly or not, they speak about the journey, not the destination. It, well, it makes sense that visual visualization manifesting would, should be a journey too. Like what, what is success for you where it's all of these things uh, that are defined or it's, you know, I wake up, I read a book, I have a beautiful breakfast made by my stunning wife, my, uh, uh, my, my Ferrari is out on the drive and I'm going to jump into, yeah. It, like it just makes sense that it's more right. of a journey. Like that's, right. that's an exciting and, and, experiment. And, yeah. and, and, and so th this is kind of a different way of doing what Neville Goddard used to call revision. And, and so in revision, you're kind of doing the same thing where, where you're, where you're reliving your, your day, but you're not reliving it the way that it happened. You're reliving it the way you wished it would have happened. And, and, and so this takes that concept even a little bit further for me be, because the way that I always used to do it was really more of like a 2D construct, like almost like languaging it. Oh, I'm this. And then I did this where, where this is, okay, let me take my astral body and literally relive the day. And, 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 and so in that way, like thinking about it as, okay, I have to spin up a simulation that represents the day r r it, it is a more effective way of, of holographically visualizing something, I think. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is, is that a, the way that we engage with AI is a microcosm of how we engage with reality. So you type something into chat GPT and it gives you feedback ba based on what it knows about reality. Well, reality is the exact same way and, and prompting reality is prayer. That's what prayer is. It, it, it's literally typing in you know, you, the, the things that you want to know about and querying reality for that information. And so the more that we learn how to use 
the processing engine, the, the sys admin of the consciousness simulation in the exact same way that we use chat GPT, the more that we have what true abundance is, which is knowing what I need to know when I need to know it. And, and we can engage reality the same way that we engage these AI tools, but have an, a more, an even more meaningful feedback loop with the, the larger consciousness system. And, and so those are two experiments that I think are um, really worthwhile and, and playing around with. And, and what do you have to lose? Like the, the worst that happens is you're like, well, that was a bunch of nonsense. But if you can explore this with a kind of playful imagination, I really think that it will open something up for the people who engage it wholeheartedly. Well, as, as meditation does to those who finally engage it wholeheartedly, as a lot of these things do that may, perhaps at face value seem silly, but you can you you gleam whatever you gleam from anything that you do wholeheartedly. Uh, I, I for one am very excited to try that experiment. I've done the revision thing a few times, never developed a, a true habit with it, but uh, especially early in sales, like just just re going through a conversation and and uh, and feeling through the success of it, even though it perhaps wasn't in the past, was very fruitful. So to extend that to to life and a push into the future. I'm personally excited for. And just, I think it's worth noting, like what simulations are you running unconsciously? Mm. You know, that, that bloke that doesn't want to approach a woman at a bar, they're, they're running that simulation every time and they're manifesting the worst and then therefore they never do it. And that becomes their, their okay. construct of their universe. So uh, very important yeah. to be aware of the unconscious simulations. And the, and part of the unconscious simulations are the simulations that you're projecting onto other people that you think they're projecting onto you because that's actually your simulation, but you're pretending that it's their simulation that they're projecting onto you, but you, they couldn't be in your simulation unless you were simulating them in that way. And, and, and so that, that's this, this kind of crazy rabbit hole that we get down where, where you have to take full personal responsibility and ownership for everything that you perceive is if you're perceiving it, you have a hand in creating it. And so why judge anything? Like this is why just feeling through your feelings and and, and seeing how the sysadmin wants you to show up in, in the larger consciousness system is the most optimal thing. And, and, and recognizing that when, when someone else is doing something to you, it's actually a part of yourself. You created that in order to trigger something in you that needed release. And so it's all gravy, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gravy, baby. We live or we learn. Uh, John, I don't know if I even got anywhere different regarding my my pretext of simulation, but I really enjoyed the chat. It was super interesting to, uh, well, I guess get pointed to that that uh that parable uh with the turtles and and tom campbell's work something i can do a little more reading on and to have a couple of things i can try that i knew was always fun for me so thank you john appreciate you yeah let us know what you thought about this and your own ideas of of simulation and simulation theory i know we went more the consciousness route in in this talk and i know that there's a a whole argument to be made that we live in a technological simulation. So if you have good resources or things that you think we should watch, definitely pop those down in the comments and we'll see y'all in the next one. Bye. It's all grabby, baby.